Welcome to another G4 Guitar Teacher Hangout. My name is David Hart. What we're going to do today is a special uh, hangout, if you like. We're, we're going to talk about getting from the, a point where, kind of where you're mid-success. So you're halfway there, where you're at 50 students and you want to take it to the next level and you want to get to 100. It might seem like just more of the same, but it's actually quite different when you go from 50, because 50 is manageable for an individual teacher. Whereas that when you start to get over 50, you have to start looking at employing people, you have to become more efficient with your systems, your operation, because the, the amount of phone calls, emails, just general admin that goes with managing more than 50 students starts to become more than one person can handle. So it's really a, a switch over from being a guitar teacher, a self-employed guitar teacher, to being a manager, entrepreneur. So we get, we're going to dive right into that and really I've got Michael Esri from Adelaide and Adam Wines from Bowie and they're both at different stages. Uh, Michael's at around 50 students now and Adam's sort of closer to 80 students and so they're, they're, they're kind of experiencing what we're talking about here and I'm going to get some input from both of them and get questions and this was brought together by Michael. He wanted to have this chat so I'm going to really let him ask a lot of the questions and move through them. Okay, so Michael, I'll let you start. Do you, do you want to tell me a little bit about your situation and, and any questions you have? Sure. So basically, yeah, I'm at the point now where, I start, where I'm starting to uh, get very busy um, and time management has become pretty, pretty crucial. So thank you for the uh, videos on time management and the whole section. I read that on the website uh, this morning. Um, and just uh, been, I've been going to a few different business workshops and seminars in the last couple of weeks, and and they're all sort of geared, you know, a lot of them are based on Michael Gerber's book. Um, and they're all talking about having systems and you know time management and hiring and all that kind of stuff. So I guess um, I've, I have hired people in the past back in Sydney, um, but uh, yeah, I always felt you know uh, I was sort of just flying blind half the time. So. Um, yeah, basically just wanted to um, get any sort of update information on what, you know, the best uh, way, first of all, um, to start looking for the right people, how people are sort of, you know, advertising or how they're finding the right people. And this is, um, I'd like to get someone uh, dedicated to do flyers. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to do that. And I, want, I do want to start sort of uh, looking for a teacher um, and going through the whole interview process and training a teacher in the next uh, couple of months. So, yeah. Okay, excellent. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll I want to get Adam involved in this as well because that way he can we can sort of get a feel of where he's at and what he's come up against and you know how he's got to where he is. So Adam, do you want to give me a bit of a background on your situation? You're employing someone. How many? You know, I know you've got close to eighty students, but what what? Tell me a bit about your school. Yeah, I have uh, one other teacher and myself, so I have a teacher under my employment. I yeah. have one main very reliable flyer delivery guy. He's a supervisor, basically. And I actually pay him a little more than my other flyer distributors. Um, but he's he's out in the most of the time. And in any given day, it just depends because some people can do it certain days and whatnot. So sometimes I'll have three or four people out doing flyers. Sometimes I'll have just him. It just depends on the day, basically. But yeah. I have about, you know, four flyer people that can go out at any given time, basically. Excellent. Okay, so you, you've you've got a guy who's kind of taking control of it, looking after most of it, which is great, yeah. and and yeah, and, and that's 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 the key is to be delegating is not to be you to be training all these different people to do different roles. What you're really looking at is training one person to take care of a, a section or a division of your business, and then train another person to be you know to to do the same. And that's really what Gerber talks about in the E Myth is the whole idea of creating the role yourself, developing the role, and, and knowing exactly what that role is to be, which is which is what one of the advantages of G4 is, is that we've laid that out. We've got all that on uh, the website. And the idea is that you, you then follow that structure. So your first person should be not only the most important person, but really the, the last person that you hire for that particular position. And you, you don't, you know, for, for Adam now, he doesn't have to go and hire more people to do flyers. He's got a guy who's in charge of it. So it's, when someone's interested in a, in that position or he needs more people, he just sends them to his to his main guy and says, "Go and talk to him. He'll he will sort you out from here." 
Make sense so far? Michael? Yeah, yeah, I guess um, one of my main sort of questions at the moment is, I guess, uh, how do I go about the legal responsibilities uh, of hiring employees? Because uh, that's something I've never really done before. Um, you know, I've, I've pretty much paid the previous employees I've had. Um, by, like, they've sort of been uh, contractors and they've been giving me invoices. Is that is that what we're still sort of trying to do or should I look at sort of paying super and all that kind of stuff for people? Well, you know, the government, the whole purpose of the tax department is to collect as much tax as possible. So their rules, that, well, actually, they're, they're balancing between two things. One is that they want, to, they want to keep jobs coming in because if you watch any election, nearly always at the top of the bill is more jobs. We're going to create more jobs. That's what every politician tries to sell. The, so if they're too tough, on the regulations around employers, especially small business owners, then hiring people just becomes more and more difficult, so then people avoid it. And that way, they they actually create more unemployed people. But at the same time, the tax department wants to collect tax. So what they do a lot of the time is they make rules, and by all rights, you're supposed to follow those rules. But a lot of the time, they don't implement those rules. In other words, they don't enforce them. Now, I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do. Uh, the rules are there, and you've got to decide for yourself uh, what you're going to do. Uh, but what I would say is talk to an accountant in your area and just get their advice on it, because they're more up to date than than you know than I am, because that's what they do. My accountant, I get his advice on on whatever. You know, if I need to do something or do this or that's changed, he'll say, make sure you, you, you do this, make sure you do that. And so, for example, in Australia, if you turn over more than $75,000, you have to register for GST and you have to pay GST. Now, the time frame of that depends on the year. So it really, when you realize that you're going to make $75,000 a year, that's when you're supposed to register for the GST. But the changeover on that, the government is not going to be too tough on. But if you let it go too long, in other words, for the last two years you've been making you know, $100,000, they're not going to be too happy and they're probably going to come down hard on you and fine you. Um, but if it's just this last year you jumped over that mark of $75,000, then they're, they're not going to be too too harsh on you about it. They're just going to say, okay, fair enough, let's get it done. And I know that from experience. So the the thing about this is that a contractor, the definition of a contractor is a very grey area. So when it comes to contracting somebody, it's going to be one of those things that you may get pulled up on. And the, the likelihood of getting pulled up on it comes more from your employee. If your employee wants to... Get a, they get upset, they don't like the terms, they don't like the money, something about it, they might decide to report you to the ATO who then pursue it, investigate it, and then make a decision on it. Whereas if when you employ them, you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, it, it'll be a situation of, you know, you follow all the rules to the letter, then there's nothing to be caught out on. So I would, you know, really, I think if you're in it for the long term, which you are, I would look at employing someone. But when you employ someone, try and find the right person. Really drill down on them. You, you, you might even contract them temporarily. And what I always did with employees and still and still do with new employees is I always make it feel temporary. Is I only need you for a short period of time. I only need you for a couple of months. That way you've got an easy out if it doesn't work out. You don't have to sack the person. You're simply saying contracts up, thanks for thanks for everything, if I need you, I'll give you a call. That way they don't feel, it, it, it helps them emotionally as well, because for some strange reason in our society, people treat their jobs as if it's a life or death situation. Once they lose their job, they get sacked. It's, it's almost this total humility, and it's not just in our culture. You go to Japan, people actually suicide when they lose their job. Uh, it, it, it's crazy. There are, there are growing men in Japan who put on their suit, get their briefcase, and go to work every day. But they don't actually go to work. They go sit in the park all day because they're too embarrassed to tell their wife and neighbours uh, that they've been sacked. <laughs> and this is not uncommon. And some of them get found out, and then they suicide. Okay, They're so humiliated. 
they have there's so much attachment to this thing called the job, which is just really is ridiculous. Uh, it, it, but that's that's how serious some people take it. And I've seen it. I've seen people who I've, I've had to let go at, at certain times, and and they just lose it. They break down. You know, I, I've, I had a person pleading to me, please don't don't let me. I I need this. This is so important to me. If I don't have this job. I'm sorry, but but this is why I'm letting you go. It's because you're so desperate. You, you you you're not actually doing the job. What I need is someone who can do the job and who's willing to do the job, not someone who's just desperate for money. So there, when it comes to employing people, just tread carefully and go through, do your due diligence and go through each of the steps. Otherwise, you're going to end up. It's, it can be. It can end up very expensive, uh, to where that you have you hang on to someone for a period of time, or you have to pay them out, or uh, they take you to court uh, to get money out of you, saying that they were dismissed unfairly. And in, in all the time with G4, there was only one guy that this that did this um, to me. Uh, what happened? I wasn't even involved. I was away overseas. But but what happened was that he walked out. Uh, because of some issue that he had with uh, another employee, and and then he claimed for unfair dismissal, when he wasn't even dismissed, he walked out, and and then he went and lied in front of the judge and, and the whole thing about you know how he was unfairly dismissed, and but the judge ended up saying in the in the court, so you don't have a case, there's no you have no grounds here. Uh, so he didn't actually win, but unfortunately, as the judge had said, said to me, he can take it to a higher court, he can drag this out, it can go on for, for months or years and become very costly financially or time-wise for you. She said, so would you like to just make him a small offer today? And so I'd advise you to take the offer. Whatever he offers you, I'd advise you to take it. So I offered a very small amount, he took it and it was done. But that's what happens. You, you, it's still, I had to, you know, I had to use a whole day to go and be there. I had to prepare for it. I had to think about it. It was on my mind. Uh, so, getting the right person, it's a bit like a marriage. Uh, you know, when it comes to employees, you want to find that person that you you trust and that you're willing to go through with it. But in saying all that, don't be too cautious. Don't worry too much. In, in you know, they say that, that very few successful people in business ever get through. Uh, without being, you know, sued at least once. It, it, it's one of those things that just happens to you. People who don't have money think that you have, or think you have money, or you do have money. They'll come after you as soon as you've got money. People will come after you. It's just an unfortunate reality of our society. Okay. So yeah. So uh, getting all that scary stuff out of the way, I think is key here for you, Michael is to go, okay, I understand the worst case scenarios. I'm going to get the wrong person. It's going to be a nightmare. They're going to sue me, blah, 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 blah. So once you sort of get your head all around that and you, you're comfortable with that, then you go about looking for the right person. And what I, one of the things about doing that short-term contract is that you can test them out. Uh, you can go through a process of where, okay, I only need you for a month. You test them out and at the end of it, you can actually see how they respond to you letting them go. And so you might say to them at the end of the month, "Thanks, you know, thanks, John. That was that was good. Um, but I'm going to let you go. No, I, I don't need you right now. So thanks anyway. And just see how they take it. Just see if they they're good about it or if they get a bit upset about it, whatever. And that will tell you a lot about the person. Okay. So maybe it's a good idea to have uh, to say, look, we're on for a one month trial, uh, and if that goes well, then we'll extend it to a three month trial." Uh, and then if that goes well, then full time. Does that would that be a fair thing? Yeah, you can you can do that, or you can do it just to say I only need you for a month. That's all I need you. Uh, the 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 trial. I mean, both have their merits, so I, I wouldn't say one way is better than the other. The the uh, the one the first one of what I suggested of saying I only need someone for a month. Then when you have them for that month, then when you finish the month. They already knew ahead of time that it was going to end, so there would be no hard feelings. But at the same time, I guess you're not testing them. Whereas if you just say I'm going to trial you for a month, and then at the end of the trial, look, it hasn't um, it hasn't worked out. Um, just see how they take it, and you can even sort of say, look, you know, if they take it really well, uh, you can you can then 
change your offer and say, well, you know, this this person did take it well. Um, and but I, I think I really think it's it's like when they train soldiers or they train uh, people for, for for most jobs. You know, when you when you're a pilot, you do a lot of simulation. You you, you know, air air hosties. That what they do is they train for emergencies, and it's. It's all about training for scenarios. I saw a, a, a situation in Brisbane where they trained paramedics for a terrorist event and they got a whole bunch of actors to pretend they were shot and bleeding and whatever on the ground and, and, and put them through it and so they could be ready for a, a real situation. So what you're trying to do is find out whether the, your employee is only there for the good or whether they're going to be able to deal with the challenges as well. Are they going to deal with you on a bad day? Are they going to deal with you when you're you're critical or you snap? It, you know what what is this person going to be going to do in those moments of stress? That's what you're looking for. What about when a customer abuses them? Uh, you know when they get a phone call from a client. How are they going to handle those situations? And this is something that we we often don't test. And as a result, I I fell into this trap. And my mother did as well with her businesses. The, that we don't test the staff under stressful situations before we put them in there and then they crack and then we see this happy person at the at the interview again I bring it back to the relationship it's all nice when you you meet your your partner and you know the honeymoon period and then it's all great at that point but what happens when all that doesn't happen what happens under a stressful situation what happens when you're both in a car fighting over a map trying to get somewhere how are you guys going to get along? Are you going to resolve it or are you going to argue and want to be right? That's really the test of whether or not the relationship is going to work because don't, don't ever kid yourself. You're building relationships with each person. These are business relationships, but they're still relationships. And it's the same with every student. Everything that comes down, whenever I see a teacher say, this student left uh, because of this or because of that, it's, it's a relationship breakdown in nearly every case. All right. That's what we do. We, with the most successful people in business, are the people who are very good at building relationships. And different people do it in different ways. And I think that's really important to to point out is that you'll have your, uh, let's say, um, you know, the kind of person who is is really kind and 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 respectful and they build that very nurturing caring relationship then you get other people who are quite distant quite cold quite hard but they still gain the respect of their their employees and they they build different a different type of relationship so you don't there's there's not one relationship that's ideal different relationships work in different for different people in different ways you know when I see someone like Gordon Ramsay uh, Calling people dirty little this and dirty little that, and you know the way he abuses people and all that—that's that's not the way that I would do it. Uh, but he 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 gains respect from certain types of people. A lot of people would you know want to punch him in the face, but other people actually respect that. They like the fact that he's straight up, that he's honest. Um, it works for some people, and so he will build relationships with certain people, and he will turn other people off. But he doesn't care. He just he he has a certain way of communicating, and he wants to know: Can you handle my style of communication? And those who can end up working for him; those who can't disappear. Yeah. All right. So if um, if uh, I was to start off by paying someone as a contractor, um, <clears throat> have you ever had any issues with like? Because obviously they have to have their own ABN, so they have to go and get an ABN. Like I mean, I've done that, but I can't even remember the process of what I went through. Have you had any issues with them sort of, you know, doing that and then, you know, having to send you an invoice and things like that? Has that, has that been a difficult process or is that pretty straightforward? Well, let me go to Adam. Adam, well, how do you handle it? Handle what exactly? I kind of the, the actual payment process, invoicing process. Are your, are your guys employees or are they contractors? When I pay someone? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So what's your arrangement with them? Are they, uh, are they employees? I pay my teacher uh, directly through PayPal. And um, yeah. I actually just have a salary, so that way I have the freedom to take students from him and put them in my group, so that we're not, I'm not worried about deducting pay from him, so I can have freedom to move the schedule around, so we can have as many openings as possible. So in other words, if he's only 
teaching like enough students to pay him say 320 but he was making 400 last week and I moved some people around I'm still going to pay him 400 so he doesn't get irritated and it gives me freedom and I'm still making profit that, yeah that make that's right yeah that's that's what I did and it's what I recommend too is that you have a set amount that way they're not you know most music schools they pay the teachers by the student and it creates a bit of tension and because yeah. they you know, they're always feeling, whereas you're paying a set amount for the shift, it works really well. But just the, the, the main question here is, are, are your employees, are, are they, are, again, I don't know the US system well enough, but do you declare them as employees working under you? Under oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. Um, the teacher, at the moment, I have them as an independent contractor, and right. I just pay them directly through PayPal, but... If I, if he gets paid enough, it might just be better off. I just might make him a W two. That just means I'll take his taxes out for him. Yeah. Okay. And, Excellent. Uh, so yeah. <clears throat> same with my it, flyer guys. Uh, if they reach a certain amount, I'll just might just start taking the taxes out for him. But at the moment, they're independent contractors. Yeah. Cool. Which it really is better for them as well because they get all the money. They don't get the you know, money less the tax that's taken out, then they declare their tax. If they're an independent contractor, they're a business in themselves, then they can actually claim more tax deductions uh, because anything related to their business, they can say, I run a home office for my admin, so any cleaning products, their desk, their computer, all those things come under the, as tax deductions. Whereas if they're an employee of yours, then they can claim some things, but most of it they can't. So at this point, like, because I remember when I was working for you, Dave. Um, so obviously I had to. I think I already had Navy, and by the time I came to you, but <clears throat> um, we used to do invoices through FreshBooks. I would send you an invoice through FreshBooks, and then uh, yeah, you would pay. So would you would you be using PayPal to do that stuff now? Um, would you still get students to? I'm uh, sorry. Uh, would you still get employees to send uh, you a an invoice, uh, or how, how would you work that? Look, I, I think just, just to sort of finish off what we're talking about, I think as the more I think about it, there's a distinction here. People who work in your location, such as teachers, then the government would probably want to see them as employees mm. rather than contractors because it's your location, it's your school. Uh, so, you know, it's a, a little bit harder to convince the government that they're, they're contractors. Where people who are out doing flyers, that's not on your premise. They, they are independent. They, that, so they could very easily be independent contractors. Um, and that's probably how I would do it. I, I would do your flyer people as contractors. They're running a, a business where they're doing their flyers f for you. And they can do it for anyone. You're not saying that they have to do it just for you. You're just paying them to do a certain amount of flyers. Um, so in, in order to, to manage your, your accounts, sorry, what was your question again regarding FreshBooks? Um, yeah, so just, um, so yeah, we used to, I think the teachers used to send an invoice every month. Um, it, it would that, you know, that was some years ago now. Uh, what would you use these days as a as a payment thing would you use? I mean, sorry, just sort of, I just remembered another question too regarding PayPal. If I pay teachers using PayPal, obviously there's a certain fee that PayPal takes out of that as well. Oh, um, no. If you, uh, what I do is I, there's an option to send money to friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just I, I say I'm sending money to friends and they don't take in a fee out, so I just pay my teacher every week. Um, I pay him like four hundred dollars a week right now. And I, it's if you say send money to friends and family, that's what I do, and they don't take any fee at all. Right. Okay. There you go. I didn't know that. That would have come in handy <laughs> with Yolkum last year, but uh. <laughs> I don't. I don't get any invoice. I don't. I just pay them every week. I don't ask them to send me an invoice or anything. Okay. Yeah, and, and so that, that's not an issue with uh, like a tax time if you don't have. Like, I guess it's only if you get audited. I guess you need to provide the invoices, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but you only need the ABN. I mean, in, in America, it's probably very similar. Uh, it's just a whether whether they say, "Hey, he didn't pay," but you've got it all on on a statement, on a PayPal statement. So yeah, you just it's send fine. when you give them a if it's an independent contract, you make a ten. Well, I don't know what your tax forms are, but you just send government the. Yeah, then fill out the tax form and say you made X amount of money this year, blah, 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 send it off. 
You don't even know if you need a statement. You just have to put how much you paid them. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You, in, in Australia, you, you do need their ABN, and it's a good idea to get them to sign a contract, uh, just agreeing to the payment. Uh, just so you've like, got something in writing. Is that like a social security number, basically? Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a business number. It, we have two numbers. We've got what's called the tax file number, which is your social security number, but then we also have a business number. So anyone who operates as a business has to have a business number in Australia. Oh, okay. Well, over in the U.S., it basically, you just need their social security number. That basically works as their, as their business. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I, I think the U.S. generally, you know, Australia is probably a little bit more regulated, um, but, you know, reading books on different people. I remember reading Arnold Schwarzenegger's book and him saying how, you know, America is the greatest country in the world because you can come here and you don't have all the regulations that you have in countries like Germany and most of Europe. He was he was really happy about the way that, you know, it was very easy to do business in America and that's one of the reasons that the American uh, business culture has grown so strong because it's, it's easy for people to set up a business uh, in the US. Um, so the Back to uh, contracting or uh, you know, sorry, paying your people. Um, you, Michael, you can easily just set up set up a, a bank transfer. You don't even need to use PayPal uh, if you want to avoid it. There are no fees, as as uh, Adam mentioned, but also you can just set up. You know, like I pay Emma a standard amount every month, and just it's automatic. I don't do anything. It just set it up once, done. Forget about it. The same as you have subscriptions on PayPal. So, Adam, are you manually paying him every week? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, if you set up a, a, an automated transfer from your bank, especially if you're paying him the same amount each each time, then that'll save you time. It's just it's, a, it's just one of those little things, and this is the habit that you, you want to create for yourself that you don't. You know, I set up Emma's payment two years ago. Um, you know, once, and that's it. <laughs> uh, haven't touched it since. So that's that's what you want. You you, you want these systems set up. You, you you will reconcile it, of course. You want to make sure that you know the amount something didn't go wrong or didn't change. But but with your employees, you know, especially with the people, hopefully that you can trust, uh, they're going to tell you if something didn't work or they got overpaid or whatever. But it's not going to happen anyway. It shouldn't happen because it's automated. It's the amount and. If you do it, I'm more about paying monthly. In business, it's standard. People get paid once a month. Your, your employee-style person wants to be paid every week, which is sometimes an indicator of they're an employee, not a not a actual contractor. And giving yourself a, a month to pay someone, two things. One is that it means that you have less work to do, reconciling your bank accounts, checking the amount. You only have 12 a year to check rather than having 52 to check. Uh, the other thing is is that by paying your employee, especially your flyer deliverer at the end of the month, that gives you 30 days for them to get out enough flyers for you to get the money and to pay them. So it's really good with cash flow. In fact, you could end up with a positive cash flow from employing people if you do it right. So if you know you're gonna, you start them here and they do 5,000 flyers in the month, that means you could get potentially five inquiries, five students, all paid up Five hundred dollars, and by the end of the month, you only have to pay them four hundred. If that makes sense, uh, just just as a, kind of a, an idea. But that's, that's that's you know, no one was uh, no one was asking me to pay weekly, so it wasn't like no one like the teacher didn't say you have to pay. It didn't. Have, I just kind of did it. Um, yeah. It seemed simpler yeah. at the time, but either one's cool. You know, it's cool. Yeah, and generally. You, yeah, the, most people are fine, but the, Michael, um, you know, he worked for me, and I used to pay you monthly, Michael, as, as you probably recall. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no problem with that. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess my yeah, with, when you employ, when you have employees, is there any uh, rules and regulations that say what, how frequently you have to pay them, or can you just choose to do a monthly or weekly? Or? No, there's no um, there no rules. Uh, I, I think probably a month is. The, the longest you would want to do it, but um, <laughs> they start to get a bit hungry after a month. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think that, I don't think there are any rules around that weekly, fortnightly. Because uh, the only reason I say that is because I've been in I've been in places where it, it varies. Most uh, company CEOs, like if you're in a corporate job, 
most of those company CEO, CEOs get paid monthly. It, it tends to be that the more you earn, the longer the, the distance in the, the pay. Whereas if, you know, if you get if you're on the low end of the stick, then most of those people live from week to week, so they need their weekly payments. Whereas you know, I think in Australia, school teachers get paid fortnightly. Uh, a lot of government jobs they pay fortnightly. Uh, yeah. Whereas yeah, a lot of CEOs get paid monthly. So I guess uh, yeah, a couple of things. I'll just have to look up the process again of getting an ABN just to sort of remember how that like what the process is there. If it's a like, lengthy one or if it can be done online, I don't know. I have to double check. That. Oh yeah, it's very easy. It can be done online, no problem. Just cool. register, register for an ABN. Yeah, it's All right. very I'll easy do process. That. Yeah, so yeah, that thanks. If, yeah, if they sorry. It, it can take three three to four weeks, though. Just keep that in mind. Oh, okay. Yep, no worries. So I guess for contractors, they would need an ABN, but if I was to employ teachers and they're just employees, then they're not going to need an ABN, are no. they? They're just going to tax one other. Um, no, that's so right. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll book in with my accountant just to have a chat about that, but just to see. Yeah. Talk, talk, to, talk to Joachim, too, because he's employing his guys, yeah. so it can give you... Cool. Some advice on there, and also look at keep your eye out for government schemes uh, for subsidising you for employees as well. There's all sorts of schemes, the local schemes, national schemes, uh, and you can nearly always find something. Uh, in uh, at the moment, I know Yoakum's paying. He ends up paying his guys who do the flyers about five dollars an hour because the government's subsidising the rest. So. There are, there are lots of opportunities out there. If, mm. if you, that's, if you that's one thing I've been, been considering. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I've, I've, I meant to ask York and that. Um, I had a brief chat with him last week about it, but forgot to ask this particular question. Um, you know, the kind of people that you get through a government subsidy program are obviously going through an employment agency. Um, you know, I guess you know, for me, I just think. Um, yeah, we want to make sure we get obviously good quality, reliable people. I just, I guess, I just wanted to make sure that that's still happening. I'm not, I'm not sort of bagging out people that go through employment agencies, of course, but you know, does that limit the selection process? Like, if we find someone who, you know, just ha who's not through an agency, um, you know, should we be looking in both areas? Or yeah, that would you're, you're, yeah, you're looking always looking for the best people uh, mm. for the job. So, so yeah, I totally agree with you. You, you, you. But this is where your employing process comes into play. So it doesn't really matter where they come from. If you have a process that they have to go through, your system will still filter out those who are uh, you who qualify. You won't be just taking people on because they are part of this scheme. If if, if you if you get a hundred applicants through this scheme and one gets through your system, well, that's it's it's got like a one in a hundred success rate. Whereas if you do it marketing on Facebook and one in twenty get through your system, then you know it, it all it all depends on uh, your your system of employing. Uh, you you know you were there uh, right? You went through the process employing for Penrith, right? You, with Yoakum. Yeah, yeah. It was we did that with Yoakum. So I just have to obviously we only went through it that sort of one one times so or one or two times. So I need to. Kind of review that again because my brain filters out information I don't need. <laughs> so yeah, I'll yeah. Review that. Well, it it really is. So it's a combination of the employment process and the systems you have in place. We what we often do, and this is you can talk to a lot of small business owners. They'll often say it's really hard to find good people, and they will complain about their employees how they're unreliable, or this, that, and the other. And they they don't stop to look at the systems of their business and the environment that their employees are working under. The environment that you create for your employees is every bit if not more important than the person you hire because if you don't create the right environment then you're not going to get the right results. You're going to get, you're, you're going to create problems. In fact, uh, I don't know if you heard that Apart from uh, the Malcolm Global book, but I, I posted it up. It was it's the David and Goliath book that he wrote, which was re a really good book if you can get a chance to read, because he talks a lot about teachers in this book. And he 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 what he does is he goes through this description of this class where the kids are 
yeah, you know, throwing things at the teacher, they're screaming, they're running around, they're jumping on their desks, they're doing all this stuff. The class is totally out of control. And and as he says, now you might assume that this class is in a really bad neighborhood in a really bad area, but in fact, this is in a very good area in one of the best schools in the US. So how can this happen? And then he goes on to explain that it's because of the teacher and the way that they they uh, handled the situation and how they created the situation. Uh, and that they they actually set up the situation so the the students became disruptive. That was they just naturally led into that that way of thinking. And when you look at kids and the way they behave, and when I hear the problems that you know, parents have with children or a adults who are teachers have with their students, most of it comes from them, but they just don't realize it or don't want to realize it. They, they're not willing to accept it's them. They would rather say that a kid is a bad kid than hey, maybe it's something to do with me. Now, there are some kids out there who just, unfortunately, but there are some kids out there who have cancer as well. There are some kids out there who have very rare diseases. That's the statistics of children who are bad, who are just bad. They, they, are, they are rare. They're not, they're not the norm. They're not common. Most kids are very flexible, very open to, to the behavior of the adults. And the same applies to your employees. You're, most people are good. Most people want to do the right thing and do a good job. Uh, but if you don't create you, you, the environment, you create sorry will will create the employee. In other words, it, they will turn them into a good employee or turn them into a bad employee, depending on on the way that you you operate and the systems you operate under. So when you see uh, a situation within your your environment, whether it's your students, whether it's your employees. Always bring it back to yourself. Always ask yourself, what am I missing? What is it about my environment? Why do my teachers turn up late? What creates that? What is it within my systems and my environment that creates the lateness? Investigate it. Find out why. Okay, And that will really help you to bring in employees. See, it, as you grow especially, you can't be just looking for these star teachers. What you need is a system that can bring in an average teacher and turn them into a star, or at least keep them running at a certain standard, so that that you know that the system creates that. So, for instance, you know, for example, with G4, people sometimes say to me, "How do you know if your teachers are any good? How do you know if a G4 guitar member is going to work out? Maybe this they're just ruining your reputation." And I know across the board we've got some great teachers. In fact, most of you. Uh, a, a way above average, um, and some of you are abs absolute legends. You know, most people out there struggle. Most guitar teachers struggle to teach groups, and some of you guys are just killing it with your groups. You just—it's just a walk in the park for you now. So, why is it? How how have we managed this? Well, the way that we've managed it is that I know your students make you accountable. I know that you are not going to be in business for very long if you don't do a good job. So I don't need to worry about that because you will start to get frustrated. And I've had one or two uh, guys like this who, who join, and without any names, there was one guy who, who joined uh, about a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, and he came back to me, and I had three complaints from students from him within a couple of months. And and I first one, okay, could just be a rarity. Second one, mm, not, not looking good. Third one, all right, and I spoke to him and I said, you really need to refund this student uh, because they're really not happy, they're quite angry. And he refused to refund them and I refunded them uh, personally. And and then I said to him, you know, it's what's your story? Tell me what's going on. He said, oh, I just had a really bad run of really bad people. Really? Is it them or is it you? And it, although I didn't say it like that, I said, look, Unfortunately, our policy of G4 is that we refund students who are unhappy, but you, it's something that you don't want to do, so I don't think G4 is right for you um, unless you're willing to get on board with the policy. And I, you know, I, I leave that up to you guys whether you refund or not, but in, with him, he just wasn't the right teacher and he wasn't willing to take responsibility for, for him in the role, and so I kind of pushed that policy as a way of nudging him out nicely out of the network without sort of you know sacking him, so to speak. So it's the the systems of G4 that the refund policy itself is a is a system. It's part of a it's a policy that tests you guys out to see whether or not you are 
as good as you need to be to be a G4 teacher. G4 teachers should be good enough to where they're willing to refund people who are unhappy. Okay, so this is something to think about, Michael, and it's something that uh, you know. I don't know, Adam. Have you got anything to add here? Is there anything in, that you can think of within your school that creates your teachers to be to live up to the standards that you want? Um, you say that again. Sorry. Can you think of anything that keeps your teacher? And I can think of something straight away, but I just want to throw it at you. Can you think of anything that gets your teacher uh, performing to a certain standard that you 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 know that the teacher is not going to uh, be be below a certain standard? It's something that within your school that ensures the teacher maintains a standard. Um, yeah, I would say one thing I feel like I have is loyalty because I, cause I pay him like the salary instead of paying him by a student. Yeah, and um, if you know if a student uh, leaves, we talk about it, we figure out what happened, and you know I don't smash him over the head or anything, and um, we figure it out. And we have every like once a week I'll call him and we'll go through all every we'll look through everything and uh, I'll. See if he um, needs help on anything. See if anything's going wrong. Fantastic. Yeah, Great. So you have this couple of things there. One is that uh, you have a pay system that ensures that he's happy, and you're not you know you're not paying him by the student. You're not creating that that kind of by the student tension, as I call it. Uh, he he knows he's getting paid a certain amount. He's and he's getting paid well, so he feels that that he's getting treated well, and therefore. He's going to to want to keep his job. He's he's in he's uh, you know motivated to want to stay in the job by by a good pay and and a, and a fair pay, which is great. The other thing there is that you're routinely speaking to him each week and not in a way that makes him feel bad. You're you're ringing him to say how how are things going. Is there anything you want to chat about? Can I help you with anything, etc. So. He knows that you're there. He can turn to you. Can talk to you about things, which makes him not worry so much through the week. If he's having a bad lesson or a couple of struggling students, you haven't just left him there and forgotten about him and, and hoping for the best with it brewing. He's being able to. He knows that he can check in with you each week, or you're checking in with him each week. So yeah, fantastic. So there are a couple of things that that really make a difference. Uh, Michael, can you think of any? Um. Yeah, I guess yeah, creating uh creating, you know, uh, there's there's one thing that I heard recently about um, you you want your employees to work with you, not for you. Um, so creating yeah, this mutual sort of team environment where their input is is always asked and, and valued, um, where they yeah they're sort of asked to go beyond what they might consider their role to be, um, and involving them with with every. You know, most most of the business sort of decisions as well. Um, yeah, that, that was sort of one thing I picked up. Great, great. Well, one of the things I read in a book recently, which uh, you know, war is not a subject that a lot of people like to talk about, but uh, it's certainly when it comes to you know guys who do fight in in these wars and, and who are in military positions, uh, strategy and and think teamwork and all that. It's life or death, so it really, really matters, and they take it very, very seriously. So, in that sense, it's good to analyze and, and read about what they do and how they handle those situations. But one of the the most flexible armies in the world is the Israeli army, and that's because they are dealing with, uh, you know, very uh, you know terrorist type uh, scenarios where they're not. It's not conventional warfare. They're there. Things can suicide bombers, all sorts of things can happen to them. So they're, they're dealing with some very, very tricky situations a lot of the time. And uh, this is not a political thing here. I'm not getting into any sides here. Um, and no, I'm not defending Israelis or Palestinians or anything. Um, so I'll put all of that aside. Uh, I have no connection to this. Just I read a good book on, on the subject of how you know it, it, the Israel army works. And uh, they have a, a situation where they don't have... Uh, the captain or the leader of their group, each group is actually voted by the squad. So if there was a like a 12-man squad, uh, it's it's not appointed from the top down. In other words, the general doesn't say you're going to be in charge of the squad. What happens is the squad they vote 
they so they create create a squad. So there's 12 men, and they say, well, we're going to vote for this guy to be our leader. And so within each each thing, they they have the rank, and they don't have rank, so to speak, uh, in terms of they address people. In other words, if the the, the top rank of the leader his name is Michael, they just call him Michael. Uh, or Mike, or whatever they like. They're, so it's it's not a there's no sir or so it's very different to say the the US or Australian military systems where they have a much more casual and they need that for the situation they're in. It's not that that will work everywhere, but what it does is it makes them very flexible. It makes the team very flexible, so they're able to adjust to to situations very quickly on the fly. So the reason I say this is not to say that that's better, um, but to Understand what you're trying to achieve. Do you want employees who are, who are very flexible, or do you want employees who follow systems? So the what you're talking about there, Michael, is creating creative, inflexible employees, which is what we need to some degree in our teachers. We don't need them. We don't. They're not working in McDonald's asking, you know, would you like a burger, fries, where there's really just a matter of pressing buttons. We, that's not what we're trying to create within G4. We want our teachers to be thinking for themselves. We want them to have the personality, to be creative, those kind of things. But at the same time, we were balancing that with using a system, which is a system of teaching and doing certain things that we know get results. So just keep that in mind, that there's a balance between the two. Yeah. Um, so the G4 method itself is a system again which creates that standard and one of the the reasons that I say you, you may look at it when I look go through sorry when you go through the employee system and training is that I get get you to or I encourage you to get your new employee trainee teachers to start off by teaching groups rather than teaching one on one because most guitar teachers who apply will either have had experience teaching privately or they were taught privately. They, that's where they come from. Or they just have a mindset that private is the way to learn guitar, which is what a lot of guitarists have, guitar teachers especially. It's not necessarily the general public's perception. They, even though there is a bit of that perception, they don't have a strong... They don't mind. Most, most people actually don't mind. They don't mind either way. There are people who want private lessons because of whatever reason, generally it's because they're shy or you know, they think they want to learn a particular song that they want to learn or in a way that they want to learn. But generally, most people who are picking up the guitar for the first time are happy to learn in a group or can be persuaded. The, the, but the teacher can often be very different. A lot of guitar teachers have this kind of private mindset. So when you bring them into your, to your system, if you get them doing intros and doing private lessons and that all goes really well, what you, what you will find, and, and I know this again from experience, is that once you promote them to doing groups, which is what people, a lot of guys think is logical, start one-on-one -on -one first and then move them up to the groups, the, what happens is that that's when they go, no, I don't like this, and they start complaining and saying groups don't work, and that's why I, I unfortunately faced that problem because I hadn't realised, hadn't thought about it. So starting them in groups, you know that they're, that they're going to survive the group scenario, um, and they're, they're good for groups, then you can get them doing the privates after doing the intros, so to speak. Okay. Um, let's get, Michael, let's go more into that setting up your employment system, which is the it, basically the important part here. But let's just talk about you and what you can expect in the next phase. And, and and, and that really is is that you will get busier for a while. It'll get to a, to a, a point where you feel like you don't have any time, and that's a, a phase over period. If you go back over the E myth, you you see where he talks about Harry who came come comes in and does the books because she's too busy making pies and and doing all the rest of it. And then before you know it, her cash flow is all out of all over the place because Harry hasn't been doing the books properly. But Harry hasn't been doing the books properly because he wasn't trained properly. And so when you bring a new employee in, we often think that that's when we can relax. Ah, oh, I've got a new employee. All's good now. I don't have to worry about things. But what happens, and I've seen this already across several G4 members, where they bring an employee in and, and then 
I hear from them a couple of months. It starts off well, and then I hear from them a couple of months later saying they're having problems with this employee, blah, blah, blah. And inevitably, when I go back over it, I find that they didn't go through the employment process properly. They didn't go through the training properly. They more or less just hired the first person they found. In nearly every case where I've spoken to them, they've, they've not interviewed more than one or two people for the job. Uh, they put them straight in the job, and then they've sort of hoped for the best. They've showed them a few of the G4 materials, maybe spent half a day with them, and, and hope, for, hope for the best from there. It's, it, you are setting yourself up for disaster when you do that. What you need to do is be prepared to nurture this person for months. Because remember, this is the person who's going to be leading and training, hopefully, your next employee and all every employee after that. The, what you're doing is you're, you're training someone. And I'm doing that with Sizer. I get on, we meet almost every day on Skype. And I and she's been with me for quite a while now, but still, I spend a lot of time with her. There are times when I can't spend time with her, but there are, I still spend a lot of time with her. And I train her on everything that I want her to do. And then once she can do it, then I know she's good to go. And I will bring on another person, uh, which will be soon, but I'm not going to train them. So I'm just going to train them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to pay two people to, to do the job of one person for a while. So it's going to be an extra expense, but I'll be paying Sizer to train the other person. So Sizer won't really be able to do much for me while she's training the other person. So I'll probably have to, to make up the slack or hire, uh, you know, well, I will have to make up the slack. But what, what will happen is that eventually Sizer will train that person. They will be able to do her work that she was doing. And now she's free to take on new work, which helps me to grow and expand. That's the process. There's always those periods where you will end up working a lot more. And when I hear, you know, small business owners or, or you know, even amongst you, for when I hear you guys complaining about that period, that's when I know you're not going to, it's not going to work. You're not going to last if you if you can't get that this is a period that you need to work through. You need to work through this period of being overwhelmed. And there's one teacher in particular I'm talking to at the moment about this where he feels quite overwhelmed by it all. But as I said to him, this is a phase where you're, you, you've grown quickly, you've got a lot more students than you expected, you've got employees now, and you're really trying to juggle everything. And you've grown quicker than you can really handle, and that's why you're feeling a bit overwhelmed. So let's just work out what we need to do. Let's get a plan and, and get the systems in place. And don't just drop the ball on your employees and make sure you're developing the systems. Any questions, Michael? No, I think that's yeah, that's pretty much um, pretty much it. So I've got a bit of an action plan now. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with um, uh, talking to a few. I think I'll, I'll start with a few employment agencies and see what programs they have, government subsidies. Um, organise some interviews for flyer. I'll, I'll start with getting the flyer person organised because that'll give me more time. Once because that, that won't take long to train a flyer person. It won't take you know, maybe a week or two yeah. really. Um, and then, yeah, I'll speak to my accountant, talk about employees and all that kind of stuff, uh, paying them and, um, and start, uh, yeah, uh, looking for teachers. So I guess that's my next sort of thing, which we can do at another hangout or whatever you want. But, um, yeah, how do we uh, start looking for teachers? How do we, where do we advertise? What, yeah. Um, de well, de definitely go through all the employee information on the member site because it's, it's pretty well all there. It, okay, cool. I'm, I'm only going to reiterate what's there already. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, just you can do a Facebook ad. Uh, I can do one for you if you like. Um, Adam, how, how did you go? Because we ran an ad for Adam uh, on Facebook. Did you get somebody from that ad? Yeah, we ran an ad for a flyer person. Yep. And how did that go? I, I can't remember. I got someone. Um, they were actually um, deaf, um, so they you know they can't hear, but. That's why they wanted the job. It was an easy job for them. Good. Excellent. Excellent. So you picked up someone there. I think it was $100 or something we spent. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's so $100 and um, he had someone. And it's a great way to go. And generally, it was the same with uh, Joachim. We spent about $100 on Facebook and he got someone. He got a lot of people actually applied, but he, but he, got a, uh, he ended up with two people. Uh, and one who ended up working out who's out there now, I think, working at um, Penrith. So, yeah. yeah. 
So 100 bucks, and that, that should be enough to certainly do the first round, you, whether or not you find the right person. Um, that depends, but you, you should get enough applicants. So, Adam, have you got anything else you want to add to to that? Any words of wisdom? Any advice? Uh, sorry, I'm waiting. If you have any questions, I can't answer them. Did, did, did you... Yeah, sorry, did, yeah, no, did, did you, well, let me put it this way, it, it, were there any, is there any kind of challenges or things that you sh you would tell Michael to be aware of from getting to the next stage to get from 50 to, to say, 80? Yeah, uh, I'm, if you, I'm, I'm sorry if you already, apologize if you already know about this, but um, the marketing that you did to get where you are now is not going to be, it's not going to work to get where you want want to go in the future because, uh, I, a while ago, I was stuck at 60, and I, I was, couldn't figure out what was happening, and basically, um, not that I, my dropout rate was this bad, but you need to be prepared for a 10% dropout rate. Again, mine's not that bad, but you just need to you prepare for the worst, basically. So if you have 50 students, you can you should prepare to lose five students a month. Not that you're saying you are, but you pre be prepared for that. So that way, um, as you're marketing, you have to cover that five students and then grow beyond that five students so that you can start to grow in numbers. So when you hit 80 students, you need, not that you will, but you need to prepare to lose eight students in a month and then market in such a way that you're going to get more over eight so you can have growth. So you want to market so you can get 16 students that month just in case you did lose eight and so, and so that you grow by eight. So that'll, yeah. Yep. You have yeah, to scale exactly. on it. Yeah, you, you've got to be yeah you've got to be allowing for that natural percentage attrition rate where you, yep. your numbers are going to drop, and you you can you know there there is a point the tipping point which is not easy to get to, uh, and I don't know whether you can get to it with adults or, or you probably can but it, I, I certainly didn't do it with adults but I did get to the tipping point with kids and that's where they start the referrals come in at a faster rate than any dropouts. So you really get this momentum happening and I, I call it the viral effect and that's, what's, that's what you're aiming for. You'll know it when you hit it because your phone will be ringing as as did 10 times a day. We were getting up to 10 inquiries a day from people trying to book in and there's just, it, it's, it's one of those things which I didn't prepare for. I didn't, I, I just had no idea, no concept and it didn't really happen until I opened the second location. So there might be something with that, having the, the two locations. It can potentially happen in Adelaide because there's four, four of you guys in Adelaide now. So together, collectively, this is why working together is really important, is that collectively it can happen amongst your students where they start to talk to each other, word gets around, and they all want to be a part of it. There, I, I was watching, um, there's, a, there's a, a great show, I don't know if you've seen it, Michael, here in Australia, but uh, it's called The Gruen Transfer, and it's, it's all about marketing. And what they do is they bring some of the top marketing guys in Australia on board, and they talk about marketing. And they were, last night episode, they were talking about Aldi and the way that Aldi are very cleverly uh, marketing themselves in Australia. And I don't know, if, do you have Aldi in the US, Adam? Uh, maybe, but I've never heard of it. Okay, Al Aldi are—they're a German supermarket. So, and now oh, Australia. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, we do have them. You do? Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So they're—they're they're huge, right? And they've come into Australia, and in, in and even though in Australia they're smaller than our two bigger biggest players, which are called Coles and Woolies, they are much bigger than Coles and Woolies on an international scale. Um, but they already have 350 stores in Australia, and they do very little advertising. And the way that, what, what um, and I've read this guy's book, by the way, um, and who, who was speaking on the show last night, he, he's wrote a, wrote a great book on marketing and advertising, but the, what he was saying was that one of the things that they did very cleverly is that they create this feeling amongst their customers of where they're kind of an insider, where I went to Aldi's and I picked up a bargain or this or that. So they, they want to share their Aldi experience with someone else. And I get that. Um, I know I, I know people who do that, and they have here in Australia that they have a, a Facebook page which has a hundred thousand, a Facebook group, sorry, which has a hundred thousand Aldi female women shoppers um, who all 
get, join in this group on Facebook and tell each other what bargains they picked up at, at Ali's. Now, so that creates a bit of an insider effect, and that's that's what happened to me. Even though I wasn't aware of it, out there doing it with with total awareness to me, it was just luck, really. Uh, but what happened is that as my students started to enrol, they would tell their friends, and they became like insiders. And this is something that you get from group teaching, and you get from teaching kids. You, you'll get a lot more of this where, uh, yeah, I, I go to this guy, I'm in one of the classes, yeah, me too. What's this? I'm not involved in this. What is it? Tell me, tell me. And then the other kids want to get involved as well. And that's what you're trying to get towards. You're trying to get to that point where you create this viral, uh, you know, trend fad in your area of all these kids who will want to be part of your program. And that's where the method works really well. They start to talk about things like their level. What level are you? Um, well, I'm an, I'm an, you know, I'm a J2. I'm a well, I'm a J3. Um, you know, how many minutes practice did you do? You know, were you on the top three list? I've been on the top three list twice now. So all these little things, if you're consistent with them and you you, you make a big deal of them with the kids, then they will start to, to get in on it. Do things like you know, take a, a, a picture, get them to take pictures of the top three when they're on it and share it uh, to their to their Facebook pages, their friends. Uh, all these kind of, and th these are not things that were happening back then. These are things that are happening now that you can really uh, leverage social media. But yeah, things like that will really help. All right. Um, I just realised the time. I've got another meeting, so I've got to cut this off now. But hopefully that's helped. And um, yeah, if you've got any follow-up questions, just yeah, send me an email or let's continue on Facebook. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your help. All right, see you. Bye. Yeah.